Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for showing an interest in what I think will be a very uh, uh, mind-stretching uh, uh, presentation. I put a rather provocative title on this, We Are Not Alone, Messages from Inner Space for 21st Century Agriculture. Uh, and I should say at the beginning, my, my background is in the social sciences, uh, and as director of the Cornell International Institute for Food, Agriculture, and Development for 15 years, I got drawn more and more and more into our experience with agroecology, which, as I will make clear, is not necessarily a contradiction to what we call modern agriculture, but is a different approach, as the dean very aptly said. So I'd like you to think about what this alternative could be. I'll start by saying that our 21st century agriculture has a challenge to produce more with less resources. In the 20th century, we do more with more, but we're facing certain limits, which we'll talk about, which make it important for us to figure out how do we get more benefit from the existing or even with fewer resources in order to achieve sustainable development, which is our topic for the Bentley Lectures. This may sound like the mythical perpetual motion machine as something impossible. However, I suggest it can be attained by working more successfully within the realm of biology which operates differently from the realms of chemistry and engineering which have been dominant in our agricultural development for the last 50 some years. In both engineering or chemistry on one hand, in biology the other, they have transformations of inputs into outputs, but biology is different that it operates within open systems which has possibilities for mobilizing both energy and nutrients. Engineering works with closed systems. And so you figure out how to get the most efficient connection from inputs to outputs. Biology is quite different in its uh, principles in that these are open systems. I'll start with the proposition that 21st century agriculture cannot do just more of the same. Now, the dean and I had a good discussion at lunch, and you, know, you don't have to necessarily accept this proposition, but I think this is correct because we see that arable land per capita is reducing as our populations continue to grow while our land area is being lost to urban spread and through land degradation, which increases year by year, our water supply for agriculture is declining with competing demands from other uses, and as climate change is reducing the amount and the reliability of our water supply. Also, pests and disease problems are likely to increase with the climate change effects. I'm struck by a figure which my colleague at Cornell, Dr. David Pimentel, put together some years ago, which he pointed out in the United States from roughly 1950 to 2000, our use of insecticides increased 14 times, yet the percentage of our crop losses due to insects went from 7% to 13%, almost doubled. So there was a, a, an inbuilt contradiction here. Our energy prices will surely be higher in the 21st century than they were in the 20th century which affects, on one hand, production costs, fuels, fertilizer, agrochemicals, and on the other side, our transport costs. So long distance trade in agricultural commodities becomes less economic than it was in the 20th century. We're facing climate patterns that will be less favorable, and these are gonna have terrible impact on the poorest countries. We can go into that later if you like, but since I work mostly in developing countries, I'm particularly concerned with this. Accessibility of technology is a real issue because the Green Revolution bypassed most of the world's poor, and we need to enable them to meet their own needs. Now, they'll still buy products, so Alberta farmers don't need to get totally worried on this, but the method or the, the strategy we've followed for the last 50-some years is not solving the most dire food and hunger problems, and we need what I would call scale-neutral technologies uh, which will be accessible to people large, middle, small, rather than being particularly biased toward one scale of production or the other. I'm particularly concerned that our agricultural productivity gains have slowed down. This is a table I put together uh, a couple of years ago, but the, the message has not changed uh, from UN and FAO World Bank figures. Uh, the green line is the grain production per capita, and it's peaked roughly in the mid 80s, about 1984. The red line is the total production, and you see it sort of started plateauing from about the mid 90s. We have not been making gains, uh, and that's one reason we had some recent 
pricings. That's often good news for farmers in Alberta, again, I accept. But for the majority of the world's population, the fact that we are now starting to experience price increases is a terrible disaster. We roughly have the real price of food from the 60s to the, let's say, 2000. But that uh, trend, which was so favorable, is now reversing. The Green Revolution technology is based on two factors. First was improvement in genetic potentials of our crops and our animals to get better genotypes or better varieties, to which we then added increasing amounts of external inputs, inorganic fertilizers, biocides, etc. And these have been successful in the past. I will make no claim to the contrary, but economic costs of production are increasing. You surely know that here. And the environmental costs are getting greater all the time. Uh, most things in life in our world experience the phenomenon of diminishing returns. Within one particular production framework or paradigm, you get gains and then you run into diminishing returns. Uh, the best indicator of this, I think, is what I learned in China. That when China started its green revolution in the 60s, for every kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer you added to your production, you got 20 kilograms of additional rice. Today, that's down to about one to five ratio and coming down. What's happened is, of course, as this happens, farmers are putting on more and more nitrogen fertilizer to try to keep the yields growing. And what that's doing is building up nitrate in the groundwater supplies to a tremendous, ferocious level. Uh, there's a USDA report saying that in China, already in the early 2000s, the, there were places in China where the groundwater levels of nitrate were over 300 parts per million. Do you know what the US EPA limit is? 50, which means they already have six times more nitrate in their groundwater in some places than they can possibly uh, live with. So the question is, where do we go from here? And the dean has posed the question, probably, do we do more of the same but better? Or is there some other alternative? Proponents of biotechnology think that with our tools of molecular biology, we can break out of the current stagnation. And they may be correct. We don't know what molecular biology will hold. It's still being developed. But I want to suggest that we consider an alternative strategy, which is generally characterized as agroecology, combining the knowledge and the practice of agriculture with an understanding of the dynamics and constraints and potentials of ecological interactions of multiple species rather than just one species at a time. As I said in my first remark, these approaches are not necessarily in competition. I mean, they can be used concurrently. Biotechnological innovations may make very useful contributions to agroecological practice, for example, and vice versa. But I'm suggesting we need to understand much more about the nature of crop production so that we can be more successful at capitalizing on existing potentials. And this requires us, as I suggest here, to rebiologize agriculture. The scientific premise of agroecology is that we can get significantly more productive phenotypes from available genotypes. How? By making beneficial changes in crops growing environments. And the system of rice intensification, which was referred to, was developed in Madagascar some 30 years ago, actually. And it's shown now in over 50 countries that it can enable farmers to get more productive rice plants from the existing varieties, local varieties, land races, high yielding varieties, hybrids, while giving more resistance to the climate change impacts, which is important. We see more drought resistance, resistance to storm damage, less lodging of the plants from wind and rain, more resistance to pests and diseases, and even some tolerance of temperature extremes, which is very interesting. And we're also finding these methods can be adapted to other crops. You'll see some of, of that. So this is really quite an interesting uh, departure from the norm that we've had. Uh, it can reduce the basic ideas of system of rice intensification, also or general system of crop intensification to the following principles. Our first goal is to establish healthy plants early and young, carefully making efforts to maintain their root growth potential. Roots, as I'm going to emphasize, is much more important than our sciences have previously attended to. Second, we reduce plant density, thereby giving each plant more room to grow from both in above and below ground and capture more sunlight and obtain more soil nutrients with the SRI system we developed or learned about from Madagascar, the plant populations are reduced by 80 and 90 percent. And yet we can get doubled or more yield 
from just those few plants by bringing about potentials, which you'll see in a short minute here. Um, and thirdly, then we keep the soil well aerated by, you know, pro not, not tilling it, <laughs> but by disturbing the soil so that the oxygen get to the plant roots and the soil organisms. Uh, and we enrich it with as much organic nutrients as possible so it supports better growth of roots and more aerobic soil biota, soil organisms. We then apply water in ways that best support the growth of the plant roots and these beneficial soil microbes, avoiding continuous inundation or flooding and avoiding anaerobic soil conditions which favor one set of soil microbes over the aerobic ones which are more beneficial. And then we control weeds, which will be a problem if you don't keep the fields flooded, in a soil aerating way with mechanical weeder, which can be motorized or mechanized uh, very nicely. But it's a crop, soil, water, nutrient management strategy. If we do these practices together, we increase the size and functioning of the root systems. I'll show you something on that. And we enhance the populations of beneficial soil organisms. And so instead of making improvements in seeds and putting in more inputs, fertilizer, we don't focus on either of those. We try to get better root growth and improve the life in the soil. Here are some demonstrations of how we get more productive phenotypes from available genotypes. This was sent by one of our colleagues in Nepal. This is a single plant grown from a single seed in the Terai of Nepal, showing the potential that is in that one little seed if the plant has the right growing conditions and if it hooks up with beneficial soil organisms. This is a picture sent to me from Cuba. I visited that farmer on the left. You can't see him several times. Now, this was in 2003 where he started using these methods. These two plants started in the same nursery. They're the same variety, Vietnam 2084, and the same age, 52 days from seeding. The plant on the right was taken out of the nursery when it was only nine days old, little tiny seedling. Transplanted not in a clump of four or five, six plants, as farmers do all around the world, but as a single plant, not even in rows, but rather in a square pattern, about 10 inches or 25 centimeters in all directions. So the plant could grow. Uh, the <clears throat> our, our colleague in Cuba was visiting Luis that day, and he was about to start transplanting, and they were taking out these plants, of one on the left, for conventional growing, and they went to the SRI field and pulled up a plant at random. You see five tillers and this one that's been in the nursery for 52 days. You see the 42 tillers on the plant, which had been taken out as a young seedling, planted in an environment with good organic matter, good soil aeration, lots of spacing, no continuous flooding. And you see not just the number and size of the roots, but also how bright the color is compared to the one that's been flooded, so the roots start degenerating. This was sent to me by a rice scientist in Iraq. They still are doing research in Iraq in spite of the war going on. I'm really quite uh, awed by the persistence of uh, Kidir. But here they took the same varieties of rice to compare with, you know, on the left you see young seedlings, wide spacing, single plants, etc. On the right is conventional manager, older seedlings, three or four per clump, close spacing. And you see just the difference in the phenotype, the physical expression physiological expression of the plant's potential with these different growing conditions uh, for all those sets of varieties that they, they tried. This is research done uh, in 2002, 2003, reported in 2004 from the China National Rice, Rice Research Institute in Hangzhou. And Dr. Tao had plots where he had SRI practices and he had conventional practices, same varieties, and he compared the, the uh, dry weight of the different organs, the stem, the sheath, the leaf, the panicle. Yellow is the senescing leaf and sheath at different stages. Initial heading, heading, full heading, milky rice, waxy rice, yellow rice. And you see how the purple, that's the panicle, that's the grains. How big a difference there is on average for number of plants averaged with the conventional controls. You see the stem, the sheath, all these organs grow more rapidly. So by the time the plant starts heading, enters into its reproductive phase. You have a different plant. And so the pictures you may say, oh, it's pictures. This is careful scientific work done by some of the top rice scientists in China, where they themselves have been able to see this difference. They did two years of trials 
uh, trying to understand how they could break the plateau they had experienced with their super hybrid rice, uh, standard rice management, 30-day seedlings, 20 by 20 spacing, continuous flooding, and fully chemical fertilizer. And this isn't quite SR, but about 75%. 20-day seedlings, 30 by 30 spacing, single seedlings, alternate wetting and drying, no flooding, and the same amount of nitrogen, but half in the organic form, half chemical. <coughs> and this is looking at the difference in yield where you have different plant populations, 150,000 per hectare, 180,000 per hectare, 210,000. The yellow column is standard rice management. And you see if you have more plants, the yield goes up from about 7 tons to 7.3 to 7.8. If you're doing these alternative methods, young plants, wide seedlings, soil aeration, even at that heavier population, it's higher there, but it goes up the other direction. So at only 150,000 plants per hectare, you've got 9.4 ton yields versus seven. And that's with less water, less seeds, and less fertilizer. I look at that data and say, we've been wasting seeds, water, and fertilizer for some time in China. And especially the fertilizer, I said, is really important not to overdo because of what it does to the environment. Uh, for many years, one of the criticisms of SRI is that the super yields we reported from Madagascar were beyond the biological maximum. When we said you get 18, 20, 21 tons per hectare, scientists are eerie, and I'll say, oh, you can't do that. If you do your crop modeling and take you know, coefficients from real plants and run it through the model for that day length, for, the, you know, for that elevation, for those temperatures, you can't get enough photosynthesis to produce those 18, 20 ton yields. So therefore, the whole thing was dismissed. Well, last year in Bihar, state of India, Farmers, actually there are five farmers who got over 19 tons, but this one farmer's got a yield of 22.4 tons, officially recognized, it was done not by crop cutting samples, they took 10 meters by five meters from the middle of the field, harvested it, thrashed it, weighed it, 22.4. The average yield in Bihar is about 2.4 tons. This is almost 10 times more than the average yield. You see some of the pictures of those panicles on the right. At first, the scientists in the Indian Council for Agriculture Research said, no, I don't, you couldn't have gotten that, but the Bihar government said, our technicians did that measurement. We had hundreds of people watching the cutting, the thrashing, and the weighing. This was for real. It's interesting that four other farmers in that same village had 19 or 20 tons their first year, but by using these spacing, timing, input management methods. We started with Madagascar, and as in 1999, there was no practice outside of that country. Over time, uh, we've expanded over 50 countries now, we've been able to see the phenotypic difference, the phenotypic response to these management methods. So these alternative methods are giving significant increases in yield, not just by increments, but often multiples, two, three, and four times more. When we say intensification, we don't mean intensification inputs, which is the way it's usually understood in modern agriculture but an intensification of farmers' knowledge, skills, and management. Not relying on petrochemical-based inputs, but on getting the most out of the plants and their association with the soil organisms. As I say, we make changes in the management of the plants, the soil, the water, and the nutrients with the effect of increasing the population activity of the soil biota. The root improvements you can see. <laughs> it's pretty hard to see the soil organisms, of course. This report from the Catholic NGO Caritas uh, in Indonesia, where they introduced SRI methods in Aceh after the tsunami damage in 2004. They started in 2005. They have had averages go from two tons per hectare to eight and a half for a number of years now. They say using less rice seed, less water, and organic compost, farmers in Aceh have quadrupled their crop production. Uh, that sounds pretty phenomenal, but we've seen this in other places. There's a report from the Hindu uh, newspaper in India, in northern Madhya Pradesh, where it's a very poor area, uh, mostly tribal population, whereas farmers average have been 1.7 to 2 tons per hectare, they're now averaging 7.5 to 8 tons. The minimum with these new methods was 4.4, and the maximum 11.5. And you can see the difference in the panicles of grain when their crops are being grown with these new management methods. The Latter-day Saints, LDS Charities in Cambodia, 
learn about these methods from one of our NGO partners there and introduce them in central Cambodia in Kampong Trang province. 146 farmers, first year. These farmers had previously averaged 1.06 tons with SRI methods they averaged 4.02. Again, a fourfold increase without relying on fertilizers or new seeds. T same seeds as before uh, and as much organic nutrient as possible. Some people say, oh, this is much too difficult and too labor intensive. Uh, the report that LDS Charities made put a picture in, I love this picture of these three boys, saying these three boys transplanted a whole hectare in one day, <laughs> whereas the conventional methods you had a whole neighborhood out, took the day probably about four times more person days, <laughs> and uh, Hung Hain was able to go from 1.25 tons to five tons. So there's a fourfold improvement again with not even more labor, but of course more careful management. And these boys apparently very skilled at getting those plants nicely and gently into the ground. So these changes are affected under very different and quite contrasting agroecosystems. In Afghanistan, we have experience, I'm going to report, from Baglan province in the northeast, 1,600 meters above sea level, temperate climate, short growing season, and then Mali. In Timbuktu region, or province, on the edge of the Sahara Desert, where you have hot, dry, tropical climate. This is a picture of farmers doing SRI planting in Baglan. They have 25 by 25 spacing, 13-day-old seedlings. Not your typical rice growing area, if you've ever worked in other parts of the world. Here's the Aga Khan technician on the left being taken to the field by farmers carrying their AK-47s because it's a still contested area. Some of the farmers who started this had to drop out because of the Taliban threats. This is a farmer looking at his field at 30 days. You see these single plants still sort of valiant, uh, just starting to, to grow. This is a single plant at 72 days with 133 tillers. The plant just mushrooms. And uh, this farmer got 11.56 ton per hectare yield, whereas before he's getting four to five. And for this is sort of the history that Aga Khan Foundation gave us. Six farmers, 42 farmers, 106 farmers, getting nine to 10 ton yields versus the four and a half, five, five and a half ton yields. This is Afghanistan. I'm happy to say the FAO in Afghanistan has now got two of our very best colleagues, one of Bangladeshi, one of Afghan, heading a program to spread this more widely there. This is a picture from Timbuktu province in Mali on the edge of the desert. That's a, a, a rice nursery. Those eight-day seedlings are going to start transplanting. That's a picture of them out transplanting in a square pattern, carefully, not just jamming them down into the soil, not putting them into a flooded field where the plants will be hypoxic, but just into muddy, wet soil. And this is a Malian farmer, again, showing the difference in phenotype between SRI on the left and a conventional plant, same variety. In fact, that's going to be a clump of plants on the left, probably three or four plants versus one single plant on the right. Uh, one farmer started this with a nine-ton yield, asked the uh, Africare NGO to come in. I was able to help get the Better You Foundation, which is, by the way, our main benefactor for this is the actor Jim Carrey, to whom I'm immensely grateful. The only foundation yet that's been willing to come forward and give us support as we share this information around the world. Uh, 60 farmers, 130 farmers, now there's thousands of them uh, because USAID and the World Bank and others are starting to get involved. But this is with 32% less water, where water is really important. And in other regions, Gao and Mapti, they're also getting seven to eight ton yields with less water, less seed. Um, so the environmental benefits we're seeing are really very substantial. We have reduced water requirements, which in a water short world has become more and more important. Uh, this puts less pressure on ecosystems, uh, which are in competition uh, with agriculture for water supplies. By having higher land productivity, uh, we reduce, produce, reduce the pressure for expansion of arable area at the expense of uh, natural environments. By using less organic, inorganic fertilizer, we're able to take the pressures off the ecosystems. Uh, the former chief executive of Britain's National Environmental Research Council in a Nature magazine article said that reactive nitrogen is the third major threat to our planet after biodiversity loss and climate change. So reducing the use and reliance on inorganic fertilizer is an important benefit for the environment as well as economic benefit if you can do better without it. 
less reliance on agrochemicals for crop protection means we can enhance the quality of our soil and water resources. Buffering the effects of climate change is going to be terribly important in the years ahead. And we're seeing also some initial evidence that there's a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from paddies. We all know that if you reduce the flooding, you'll stop or certainly uh, reduce gradient of production of methane. But we're also finding that there's no offsetting production of nitrous oxide when you have aerobic rice production. Uh, there's a study done in Korea, Kangwon National University, uh, which found, in fact, a two-thirds reduction in the CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions from rice paddies when you use SRI management methods compared to conventional flooding. This is a picture sent by Sri Lankan colleagues of two rice fields. On the left was conventional management. Plants were flooded, close-spaced, roots degenerated. On the right is the SRI field. This, these fields have not had water for three weeks. As you see, the one on the left starting to struggle. And the production was greatly disturbed by this. The field on the right was able to give a normal harvest. In Bihar state of India, where they started with very small numbers of farmers in 2007, 128, 5,000, 8,000, 19,000, now it's probably over 200,000. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that they looked at the yield. They had normal rainfall, really good results. Then water submergence twice. Then they had drought with some rainfall. In 2010, they had a complete drought. I mean, this was really a disaster for the state. The, the uh, state's uh, Rural Livelihood Promotion Society did tests on 74 farmers' plots where the farmers were side by side, had SRI plot, regular plot, same variety, same soils. They found that you still got twice as much yield in that drought season with SRI management compared to conventional management. And that was actually higher than the 2.3 ton average, which they got in a normal year with conventional methods. This is uh, data sent from China, from Sichuan province, where the Provincial Department of Agriculture by 2004 was satisfied started working on this. The first year they were promoting was 1,133 hectares. By 2010, it was over 300,000 hectares. The two years in which they had drought, 2006 and 2010, were the years in which the relative advantage of SRI management was the greatest compared to even normal years. So that we're finding that in drought years, you get even more relative benefit in productivity from using these kinds of methods. Here's one of my favorite pictures from uh, Vietnam. This is about an hour's drive north of Hanoi. These two fields, left and right, have been hit by the same tropical storm. On the right is a conventional field. On the left is a SRI field. On the right is the plant. On the right, the woman's holding is a conventional plant. On the left is an SRI plant. And you can see what that storm did to the conventional field. Serious lodging, virtually complete crop loss. On the left, with good root systems, strong tillers, plants are able to resist the force of the storm and give a not just normal, but actually a very good yield. This is research from China done at Tokyo University, looking at the effects of interaction among irrigation methods, age of seedlings, spacing. And they documented what we see in the field, that if you have intermittent irrigation versus flooding, younger seedlings versus older, wider spacing versus closer spacing, get a huge difference in the plant's ability to withstand the effects of wind and rainstorm. This is from the National IPM program in Vietnam, where they did studies in eight provinces, side-by-side -side comparisons, SRI plots and farmers' methods plots in both spring season and summer season, found that the worst diseases and pests that they dealt with in Vietnam were reduced by 55% in the spring season and 70% in the summer season just by the management methods. The plant's own inherent ability to resist these effects. This may be more, uh, more persuasive than numbers. Uh, this picture is on the poster, which I thank Miles for. Uh, the farmer who has the right-hand field gave me this photo, which she was very proud of. Her neighbor had used a modern variety, fertilizers. She'd used a traditional variety and organic methods of production. And this village was hit both by brown plant hopper attack, biotic stress, and by cyclone, abiotic stress. And you can see the neighbor got virtually nothing because of the brown hopper burn compounded by the lodging. She got an eight ton per hectare yield with the traditional variety uh, on that field. So these are really significant differences uh, 
In Andhra Pradesh, India, they were doing IPM tests with SRI versus normal, and they got a cold spell of five days below 10 degrees Celsius, which just, just I mean, got the normal methods got no yield, 0.2 tons per hectare. The SRI plots still gave a 4.16 yield. It could have been even better without that, but still it's a very respectable yield. And so even extreme temperatures can be buffered if you have a good root system for the plant and if you have the life in the soil which will support that. This is, I guess I refer to this, the uh, study done at Kangma National University on reduction in greenhouse gases. Now what's really interesting is that we're seeing these ideas being transferred to other crops. Wheat, sugarcane, finger millet, mustard or canola you call it here, teff, sorghum, turmeric, and a whole variety of legumes and vegetables in both India and Ethiopia, a little bit in Mali and Nepal. This is still just starting, but we're getting, uh, and I have, by the way, for some of you, if you're interested, a little booklet that I did for a talk at the World Bank on this other crops. We're seeing with finger milk three to four times increases with these alternative management methods. Legumes 50 to 200 percent, maize 75 percent. That's the laggard so far, but maybe we can improve that. Mustard, three to four times increases. Mustard plants as tall as I am. We've, we've seen these, starting from that little proverbial mustard seed. Uh, Sugarcane, uh, teff in Ethiopia, three to five times. Turmeric even, a 25% yield, but doubled income because costs are lowered. Vegetables, wheat. This picture is sent from Ethiopia from an NGO partner that's being supported by Oxfam America. And you see the difference in the panicles of wheat this is from Mali, you see the difference in the plants, and then the, in the panicle length and the size. This is a picture sent from a Bihar state of India where they're showing some of the wheat panicles with their SWI system of wheat intensification. Uh, sugar cane is very amenable to these ideas and, and methods. Uh, 20 to 100 percent more yield, but with 30 percent reduction in water and 25 percent less chemical inputs. Uh, Here's a picture of finger millet, where on the right you have a conventional management of a traditional variety. Now you have conventional management of an improved variety in the middle, and then SRI, SFMI management of improved variety on the left. Just a totally different plant. And this is expression of the potential that's in that plant already, because that same potential you see on the left is there in the plant in the middle, but it's not being expressed. And this is our most recent addition, the system of TEF intensification in Ethiopia, where the plant on the right held by the sun is a conventionally you know, grown plant. They broadcast TEF normally. On the left is a transplanted seedling. And again, a TEF is like mustard. Tiny seeds, they start with you know, tiny seedlings, 20 by 20 spacing, and give them a chance to grow. And so this is what we're seeing there. So these results don't argue against making further genetic improvements. We always want the best genotypes to start with. Plant breeders in the audience, please be comforted. <laughs> this is nothing against plant breeding, but we've had a approach in agriculture for the last 50 some years that the, the starting point for improvement is a different and better genotype. And we'd like to see that work continue, but we should sort of understand that you can get a lot of production from existing genotypes if you work on the management side. It doesn't argue against the use of external inputs, but for the most part, we're finding you don't really need much. And I like to say this SRI method is not doctrinally organic, it's pragmatically organic. If farmers can do better with you know, inorganic fertilizer, we have nothing against that. But we found, especially for the farmers we work with who are really resource constrained, that they can do better by using a more organic strategy we say progress can be made right now at low cost with savings of water, with buffering against climate change by changing the crop management practices, especially attending to the nurturing of roots and of soil biota. Now, now I get to the part where I'll try to tell you what I think is going on. How is this happening? What's going on? I'll start first though with two practical conclusions. The first is that instead of focusing so much on feeding the plant with fertilizer, we should be feeding the soil so the soil can feed the plant. Some of you already know this motto, and I thought it was sort of catchy and propaganda when I started this 10, 15 years ago. I'm now quite convinced with a lot of experience and evidence that we should be focused on how do we feed the soil so the soil can feed the plant. 
The soil is not some inert medium to anchor the roots and absorb our inputs. It's a system. And we should understand that. And second, rather than focus so much on growing plants, we should do whatever's needed to grow roots. I tell farmers, don't worry about growing plants, grow roots, and if you grow good roots, the plant will come. We've had farmers in Madagascar who had their whole SRI plot grazed by locusts, which come every 17 years and just devastate us. The locusts take the whole plant, come back a couple weeks later and the plants are there. If the roots were started in a good environment, gently, carefully, they can regenerate that above ground growth pretty easily. So grow roots and let's attend more to the soil biology. Those are the practical things. What we're seeing is the importance of abundance, diversity, and activity of beneficial soil organisms promoted by soil organic matter and then by the exudates, which large functioning root systems will pump into the soil. Uh, and they support plant growth and health. We're just starting to understand better the contribution of symbiotic endophytes to mobilizing the surfaces of the plant microbiome for aiding crops. I don't know, I want, I, it's dark, I can't see how many put their hands up, but I hope you've all heard of what we call the human microbiome. All the bacteria and fungi in, our, in on, and around our body without which we cannot live. That's getting a lot of press. Nature magazine has something every month at least on the human microbiome. But what I'm saying is that plant microbiome is equally important for the functioning of plants. And this little weeder, which was, I mean, it's been variation used everywhere. This costs about $20 in Sri Lanka. What this does is not just remove weeds, but it aerates the soil. And we see wonderful effects of this. This is reported from Nepal in the Morang district, where 412 farmers are using the methods. <coughs> they average 6.3 compared to 3.1 tons per hectare. But if you broke out the number of weedings they did, those farmers did one weeding, 32 of them, got 5.16 average. Most of them did two, that's what we say, do at least two, so farmers do at least two. That's 600, you know, 0.6 tons more simply by doing that extra weeding. This is about a 10 to one benefit cost ratio, so it really is effective. But three farmers did three weeding, or 14 farmers did three weedings, they got two extra tons from that extra soil uh, you know, aeration. This is what first got me onto this track. This is data that I you know, worked out from Madagascar when we were just getting started in this. And we had 60-some uh, uh, farmers. Two farmers did no mechanical weedings, and they got 5.9. Normally, by the way, it's two to three tons in this area. Eight farmers did one weeding. 27 farmers did two weedings. They got you know, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5. 24 farmers did three weedings. They got 9.1. And the 15 farmers did four weedings, got 11.7. That just hit me between the eyes like a shock. Something's going on here which we ought to be looking at. And I can't tell you how hard it has been to get anyone even to pursue this. But I'm quite sure that active, you know, if you don't flood, you get passive soil aeration. <clears throat> if you use this weeder, <clears throat> you get active soil aeration. And it pays. Big problem is this takes a lot of labor if you're doing this by hand, but farmers in Malaysia now have developed five row weeders that are motorized. They've even got a 11 row weeder in, you know, in design phase. So the, this active soil aeration, don't call it weeding, is something that we're seeing coming more and more. And I think it's a principle that could apply to agriculture elsewhere. This is the results which first got me onto this track. And these were results from a thesis done in Madagascar in 2001 then and finished in 2002, where these were controlled trials, replicated trials, six for each of the figures shown here. And if you look at the right-hand column, if people did their traditional cultivation, older seas, lots of plants, flooding, actually didn't, didn't in this first set of trials, there wasn't any fertilizer added, a 1.8 ton yield, which is about the Madagascar average, if you simply use the SRI cultivation methods, young seedlings, wide spacing, soil aeration, organic, no, this is no organic matter either, excuse me. You got up to 6.1. If they use NPK fertilizer, they went to nine tons with SRI methods. Both compost, they add another one and a half tons over and above what you get if you did the inorganic fertilization. That was on clay soil. On loam soil, there's some different results, which is interesting. I mean, soil systems work very differently depending upon the structure and composition of the soils themselves. For me, what was interesting is that 
they took samples of these roots from the different sets of plots and they analyzed them at the Pasteur Institute in Tananarive and looked at the, the number of colony forming units for azospirillum, which is a sort of indicative, uh, it's a dye azotroph, it's nitrogen fixing, and they used that as sort of an indicator species for the organisms in the roots. 65,000, 1.1 million. If you put on NPK, you cut that back by 60%. Because when there's inorganic nitrogen supply, the nitrogen fixes just don't prosper as well. If you went to compost, it went up to 1.4 million. And so you see there's, uh, th these are the kinds of interactions between soil organisms, in this case, inside the plant. In the root zones, there was not a big difference. Inside the roots, there was very substantial differences. This is work done in India at Tamil Nadu Agriculture University where they looked at conventional rhizospheres and SRI rhizospheres, total bacteria up by about a quarter, azospirillum four times more, azotobacter doubled, fossil bacteria about doubled. We don't know why these management methods change the concentrations of different soil biota in the rhizospheres of the rice plant. Same variety, same soil, same climate but the wetting and drying, the organic matter, the age of seedling, the rapid root growth, all contributes to a very different uh, combination of organisms. This is the work done at Ipe Bay, which is the leading agricultural university in Indonesia. The red bars are for conventional management, the yellow bars for SRI management, looking at in total bacteria, diazotrophs, nitrogen fixers, phosphobacteria, are ones that solubilize phosphorus, and azotobacter is one of the uh, leading uh, diazotrophs, you see at these different phases of growth, active tillering, panicle initiation, or flowering, the SRI plants have a very different set of companions in the soil than do those which have been conventionally managed. These are measurements made looking at dehydrogenase, urease, acid phosphate activity, nitrogenase activity. Again, these numbers can often vary all over the place, but consistently, if you average them out, you see that in the SRI managed plants and in the rhizospheres, you get a different kind of life in the soil. There's another thing showing the same thing with in total microbes, azotobacter, spirillum, phosphorylizing bacteria. Go from conventional management, NPK, to uh, uh, SRI management with, in this case, with fertilizer plus a biofertilizer. Got the highest results. So, again, we want to emphasize this is not anti input but it's trying to understand how can we mobilize the services and benefits of microorganisms. Now here's where the plot thickens, if I can put it this way. If we start appreciating the contributions made by symbiotic endophytes, or endophytic symbionts, if you like. Have any of you ever heard of endo, em, you know, symbiotic endophytes? Well, let's see, I can't see hands. This is a really interesting idea. I hope you'll follow this through. Uh, this is work done in China published in the Apply Journal of Applied and Environmental Microbiology, first-rate journal. And Feng Chi did most of the work, but Frank Dazzo at Michigan State was one of the co-authors who reviewed the work and, and approved it. They did samples where they, they took soil and they sterilized it, so it was all easy. And they did six sets of pots. And the first one they left without any amendments. And then the other five, they put different species or different families of rhizobacteria. And they grew them the same variety of rice in each of the six. And what they found is that compared to the control, where there had been no enhancement of soil biota, different species of rhizobia, I'm sorry to show the edge part, but you got more plant root volume, higher shoot dry weight, the net photosynthesis rate was significantly higher for all of those, the water utilization efficiency was higher, the grain pot, the grain yield per pot higher. 51 grams per pot versus 77, 64, 61, 86, 86. This was simply by having those plants inoculated with a particular rhizobium. In this case, they used microscopes to be able to trace and demonstrate that the soil biota had actually migrated up the roots, up the stems, into the leaves, and into the sheaths of the plants. So the soil organisms were living not just in the soil, but up in the canopy of the plants. And having these kinds of effects on the plant, which means on the expression of their genetic potential. Feng Chi and colleagues followed this up with another article then in Proteomics, just 2010, where they looked at the expression of genes in the leaves, in the sheaths, and in the roots. 
and they could identify in each of those places, 1920, sort of genes that were either upregulated or downregulated significantly, so that you had more than twice the difference in the proteins that were expressed from these particular genes in the plant genome. Uh, it, in the least, for instance, there was one protein which is key to pro photosynthesis that was upregulated in the plants which had soil rhizobia in the leaf tissues versus plants which did not have soil rhizobia in the leaf tissues. So what we're seeing is a very intimate connection between the soil organisms and the plant's expression of its inherent potential for any given gene. Uh, this is interesting work done by Rusty Rodriguez, who used to be with the U.S. Geological Survey in Washington. He's now set up a company to do commercial development of fungi that have a very positive effect on plant growth, including their drought tolerance or drought resistance. In this case, a journal article in Communicative and Integrative Biology is looking at the ratio of root growth to shoot growth in symbiotic, meaning inoculated, and non-symbiotic, non-inoculated rice plants. Uh, he was infusing a fungus, which many of you will say, Fusarium is terrible, terrible fungus, terrible fungus. But Fusarium colmorum inoculated in the seeds of rice plants, or seeds of rice, which have been sterilized, so there are no other organisms. They simply inoculated one set of seeds with this fungus, the other was controlled, no inoculation, and they had five times more relative root growth in the inoculated seeds, and something very objective, root hairs emerged two days sooner than in the uninoculated plants. So something's going on we do not understand very well or very fully. But the relationship between, in this case, fungus is not bacteria, and the plant's expression of genetic potential is very dramatically in, uh, altered. This is showing at zero days, just, you know, the roots are starting to appear, two days, four days, eight days. You can see how different is the root architecture of the seedlings coming from seeds that have been inoculated with a fungus to the right of the divider versus those that have been uninoculated to the left. So I wish I could tell you we had lots of answers to what's going on, but we're seeing evidence of what I call the plant micro, we should all call it the plant microbiome, which inhabits the plant in, on, and around the plant. I mean, you know, we used to talk about the rhizosphere being the soil on, around the roots, that's no longer a good understanding. The rhizosphere, in a sense, bridges the membranes, and it really should be understood as sort of reaching into the plant, in effect, because there's not a simple cutoff between soil outs. The organisms that live in the soil outside <laughs> and the organisms that are inside, they're really moving back and forth. So one of the final things I'll just see that I'm coming within my hour. Um, more productive phenotypes can also give us higher water use efficiency, as reflected in the ratio of photosynthesis to transpiration. Uh, one of our now good colleagues, uh, Dr. A.K. Takur, who is an Indian Council for Agriculture Research senior scientist, a soil physiologist in Bhubaneswar, was sort of put off by some of the critiques being made of SRI by some of the established scientists and literature, so he went on his own, without ever telling us or anyone, just to test the two methods. So he went to our website, and wrote down our recommended practices, went to the Central Rice Research Institute website in India for its recommended methods, and he tried these for three years and developed very clear evidence of what should have been done by scientists earlier on, but showing all kinds of physiological changes and morphological changes. And in particular, I think it's really important, he found that for each millimole of water lost by transpiration with SRI plants, you had 3.6 millimoles of CO2 fixed in the reg you know, recommended management practices of, of the, the, the Indian scientists, only 1.6. So we're getting twice as much carbohydrate, as much energy, as much food value produced per unit of water in these plants. Now again, what's going on? I cannot give you a very good answer. One thing, I'm a social scientist, so that's not my turf. I would love to see many, many of the plant physiologists, plant scientists, biochemists, agronomists here in Alberta and, of course, everywhere else, trying to understand what's going on. Someone says, oh, SRI isn't relevant for Alberta. We have these huge farms, highly mechanized. The scientific principles should be really relevant. And we're already seeing in Pakistan, where one of our 
colleagues who's a very wealthy farmer, machinery importer, taking up these ideas and mechanizing this practice with raised beds, zero tillage. He calls it paradoxical agriculture because we get more from less running SRI with conservation agriculture and organic farming. He's welded these things together. He's cut his labor by 70% over their normal amount. The water use by 70% of the normal amount and his average yields are about 12 tons per hectare on a 20 acre trial plot. His trial plot was 20 acres. <laughs> now he says if we're gonna think big, we've gotta not just have a little dinky trial plot. So he's 20 acre trial plot almost, and this is supervised by the Pakistan Agricultural Research Council. So it wasn't just him going off and do it. He had the scientists from the government coming and saying, here's how you properly measure this big area. Take 10 random samples, harvest them and weigh them carefully. 11.96 tons is the average. So we are seeing some things out there in many countries. We're starting to get some scientists involved in this, but they're almost all from India, China, and there's almost no American scientists, and I think no Canadian scientists, have even taken an interest in this so far. Uh, we can proceed without the cooperation of scientists. We are proceeding, <laughs> we will proceed. But we'd like it so much better if we could be working this as in a collaborative way. So that's why I was very glad to receive the invitation to come and to share our knowledge with you. Uh, and hope there will be some people, maybe it's gonna be up to the next generation of students to do this. Maybe most of the faculty have got the research program pretty well set. Uh, Cornell, we have very little interest among faculty. Students are much more interested in this, seeing the possibilities for an agriculture which works in some different directions. Not doing more of the same, but rather trying to uh, develop this. Anyway, my last thought here. Economics, environmental vulnerabilities, and climate change effects will require a different kind of agriculture in the 21st century. If someone wants to argue with that and raise objections to my proposition and the questions, I'd be very glad to. I, that's where I think we are. These three factors, economics, environmental vulnerabilities, and climate change, are all going to require us to have a different mix, different set of technologies in this century than the last one. My suggestion, we try to rebiologize agriculture. And as I told the dean at lunch, that doesn't mean going backward, it means going forward. Um, Fortunately, there are opportunities for a paradigm shift appear to be available, but they will require significant changes in our crop sciences and our soil sciences. With work in microbiology, physiology, soil ecology, and epigenetics becoming more central to agriculture. And the closing thought, be very provocative, is that you know, many of you will know in Darwin's you know, origin species as a, a diagram of this tree of life, you know, bacteria and fungi and plants and animals, and of course we're up at the top. And I like to tell my students at Cornell, this is good taxonomy, but lousy biology. Because it implies that somehow we left the organism, microorganisms behind. Of course, we're now above them, beyond them, superior to them. And the message I would want to leave with you is that we never left them behind. They're with us still. Thank goodness. So my message, we need to appreciate the inhabitants of inner space, our inner space. We ourselves are fully infested, infected, resided in by microorganisms, but plants are in the same situation. So if we're gonna have a sustainable agriculture for the next uh, century, we have to know that we are not alone. We should welcome and pursue parallel advances in our knowledge about the human microbiome and the plants, I say plant soil microbiome. It's not just plant micro, it's a plant soil microbiome. And this brings new dimensions to our understanding of agriculture and ecology. This shift in paradigm can help us to make our agriculture more sustainable, which is the reason you have the Bentley lectures. You want to figure out how can we make our agriculture more sustainable. Some of you will say, well, it's fine for the developing countries, the resource limited countries, the less advanced countries. We here in Alberta, you know, we're beyond that. I don't think that the conditions of the 21st century are going to let your agriculture producers, you know, indefinitely continue on the path that you are on now. Uh, I'm not saying you replace that, but we've got to find a way that that modern agriculture becomes reconciled with, learns from, and benefits from what we're finding on a more agroecological mode. Anyway, you gave me an hour, and I think I'm within that. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions and discussion to follow.
why has it taken so long for this common sense to gain some credence? Or can you state it again so everyone can hear it? Yeah. That was it. Okay. Um, in some sense, I should leave that to others to answer. Maybe I'm too too much involved in this. Uh, there are lots of reasons why I think we've encountered either uninterest or active opposition. It ranges from dismissal to actually sometimes fairly strong attacks. Um, I think it's a common, first of all, it's not going to be any one answer. I think I can safely say that. Um, it's a common, the two main things are that, A, this is going in the face of a lot of existing commercial interests. I'd have no evidence directly, I have lots of sort of fragments to suggest that we've got some resistance coming. Although I'll say, for instance, Syngenta. We've had very good relations with Syngenta over the years. Uh, its Bangladesh vice president joined our SRI steering committee in 2002 because they were using these methods for their seed multiplication and getting wonderful <laughs> results. They tried to call this the Syngenta system of rice intensification. But the NGO said, no, no, no. And they said, oh, we thought it needed a name. And the NGO said, it has a name. So, but the vice president agreed to be part of it. So, uh, and Syngenta's Development Foundation doesn't work in India and in Mali with SRI. Uh, we haven't had any interest that I can tell from Monsanto. I had good discussion with Bayer, by the way, when I was, I was invited to the Federation of European Rice Millers to come and talk about this in Venice, Italy. What a wonderful place to go to talk about my favorite subject. And spent an evening with when they're rice scientists. We had wonderful discussions, and, uh, you know, so they do know about this. Um, probably the more important thing is that this is a paradigm shift. And one place it's good to have been, or this is why it's good to be social scientists. So the paradigm shifts are really hard. Uh, let me tell you my most provocative idea on this. I asked myself some months ago, what is the most difficult paradigm shift that we people, homo sapiens, have had to make in the last 500 years? And I think it's a shift from the geocentric to the heliocentric model of the universe. For millennia, we had thought that the whole thing revolved around us on Earth. You know, we are the center of the universe. And here comes Copernicus and says, hey, you know, actually we're going around the sun and the sun's going around the, you know. That was a really hard paradigm shift for we people to make. Then I thought, you know, it's interesting because what we're talking about with SRI is kind of something like that geocentric to heliocentric transformation or shift. Our agriculture is not so much geocentric as egocentric. We think we're the cause of everything, and it's our you know, work, our genius, our brilliance to design and redesign plants and develop inputs, and, so forth, and we will feed the world. I hate to hear that. It's a transitive verb, we will feed the world. Now, the world's got to feed itself. We can help. But just as with the shift from geocentric to heliocentric cosmology, <laughs> we have to go from an egocentric to a heliocentric cosmology, where it's the energy from the sun that continually charges and recharges our Earth's biosystem, biosphere, which we then draw on and harvest the energy and the nutrients and so forth from that. And for a lot of people, that's hard. Now, for many people, no. I mean, they know it already. Maybe it's common sense, maybe it's not. But we have a lot of people who really have a hard time getting away from that egocentric notion of agriculture. It's us. And I say, no, we're an important part of it. We can certainly improve it. I mean, I'm an academic. I'm trying to you know, develop knowledge and share it to improve it. But I have certainly disabused myself of an egocentric view of agriculture, given all the things I've seen and heard from now hundreds of thousands of people over the last 15 years or so. So it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's a repositioning. A lot of researchers have a huge investment in fertilizer trials, fertilizer results, the breeders and their varieties. Breeders, I think, may have the hardest time sort of accommodating the notion that the genetic potentials already, some of which they've produced, are already sufficient. I mean, we could certainly meet all of our food needs with what's there already. Now, should we have still more and better ones? Sure. If we can get more resistance to certain biotic and abiotic stress, so that's good. But in terms of production of food, we are seeing such tremendous increases 
achieved by different management mobilizing those soil biota. And that's the, for me, that's the bottom line. And I think for a lot of people, that's difficult. Uh, but others can judge us, I'm sure, better than I can. Okay, good question to start. Who's next? Yeah. Go ahead. Over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's lights right You're on. Right, lights right in the face. I can't really see. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for this, this presentation. I think just a couple of comments and maybe a question. Mm -hmm. That um, this provides a scientific, scientific legitimacy and, and an understanding for what I think um, many of us have uh, inherently understood for many years with respect to uh, less capital-intensive agriculture and labor-intensive agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, we turned from, returned from a recent uh, trip last year from Peru, and I was struck with the, the harsh environments there and the uh, uh, thousands of varieties of potatoes that uh, form the sustainable basis of labor-intensive uh, uh, agriculture in some of those many higher um, environments of Peru, even as high as almost Machu Picchu. But um, it also, um, I think, uh, um, reflects back on some of the thinking, philosophical thinking and practical thinking that came um, uh, in the literature to the fore in the uh, 60s and 70s. And I particularly refer to the British engineer, train engineer, that is, uh, Shoemaker, and his small was beautiful, and referencing the need for bringing agriculture back uh, to human terms, but without the um, uh, on uh, the linkages, the scientific linkages that you presented this afternoon in terms of an understanding of what the inherent um, um, uh, value of that uh, ability of humankind, also coming from native peoples perhaps uh, as well, um, with respect to what is really going on in the soil and the microorganisms of the soil that uh, ultimately provide sustenance to the, um, the, 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 the plants and the uh, productivity that you've cited in your, your talk this afternoon. So I guess that's more comment and, and perspective than a question, but um, I, I think it would have been, uh, it's useful in presenting this kind of information um, to lay audiences as well as academic audiences that the very detailed scientific information that's coming forth now from your multiple tables and so on are linked to some of the broader inherent kind of understandings we have that were brought forth in, uh, by writers such as Shoemaker and his Small is Beautiful. Yeah, I just wonder if you have any further comment on that. Sure. Um, SRI, unfortunately, very early on, come back to your question, got the rap of being labor intensive, too labor intensive. And what we could say initially was, well, it's certainly more productive. So per hour, per day of labor, you get more return. It may require more labor initially, and it does clearly require when you're learning. There's always a learning curve. And for some people, that may be a barrier. The fact that something doesn't work for everyone doesn't mean it wouldn't work for a lot. But the argument doesn't work for everybody, you know, forget about it. It's not one solution to fit all. Uh, it's been one of, our, one of our problems. What we found, though, is that many farmers report, even the first year, they can save labor, because you've got only 10% of many plants. You know, you're not trying to keep it flooded all the time. Uh, sometimes they say there's more work to harvest but most farmers don't mind more labor if they're getting a good harvest on that. And even harvesting sometimes not more because the, the panicles are so much more uniform that they say when you're cutting, and they're all uniformly ripened, which I don't understand why, but they are. So actually, even you get double the yield with no more time in the field doing the, the cutting. More for transporting, though. You can't save on that. But I would say that, and this sounds terrible in a scientific audience, in many ways, SRI is love intensive. And, uh, I mean, you can take that however you like. But farmers doing SRI have a very different relationship with their plants. And I've had any number of farmers tell me, said, you know, I now go to my field at least once a day or every other day. I love to watch the way it grows. One of our friends in Sri Lanka said his 16-year-old son was now voluntarily going to do the weeding. Had he got home from school, so he just loved the feel of the plants and so forth. You know, you know what 16-year-olds are usually like. So for a 16 year old go out and do that weeding because he enjoys it. I mean, there's a kind of a, of a connection. Well, I want to be mystical about it. I'm saying people, you know, they really appreciate what these plants are able to do with the proper care. But for the most part, we find farmers say it's actually labor saving. Now, we want to make it more labor saving by also mechanizing as much as possible these different processes. We have mechanical transplanters in Costa Rica, Iraq, Pakistan. So, you know, we're working toward that. 
And that's why I think there could be a time when this becomes much more feasible for farmers here in, in Canada uh, on potatoes. In the same village in Bihar where they had that huge yield I told you about, four months later a farmer got a world record yield of potatoes. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but the technicians who measured it from the government are vouching for it, 72.9 tons per hectare. The previous world record from Holland was 42. But I've seen pictures, pictures potatoes were weighing one kilo each. What was going on? I don't know. But I think something microbiological was probably going on. So we're seeing some really unusual things. Schumacher's philosophy I found very helpful myself. It's interesting, we had him visit Cornell uh, in the mid-70s when he was still traveling. And he really was disappointing because he was taking a very dogmatic view that biomass was the only way to go for agriculture. And those of us who work in developing countries you know sometimes our farmers who can't afford to take their rice straw for mulch, they got to feed it to the cattle or use it for fuel. And a lot of people have really small holdings, they can't do green manure. And so we sort of backed away from it because it was just too, we try to be very pragmatic, very flexible. And one thing I will say, and here's a place where maybe people in Alberta can help, we have not put even probably 1% as much research funding and effort into improving our organic fertilization of crops as we put into inorganic fertilization. You know, the money, the, 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 the doctrine of how you do it is all inorganic. And, you know, when I go out and work in rural areas, I see people, you know, harvesting you know, biomass with machetes and trying to chop it up, you know, for composting. It's really, we do not have tools, implements for good, efficient collection, transport, processing, and application of biomass. We've got to build up the organic matter in our soils worldwide, but especially in poorer countries where the soils are so bedreft, virtually dead. And we should have a real worldwide campaign, develop the appropriate implements and tools, develop you know, knowledge about the best varieties for green manures, cover crops, figure out how we can solve any legal problems for people using wasteland, where it's perfectly able to grow, you know, not crops, but biomass. I mean, we find that any biomass you know, appropriately composted will be beneficial for plants. Why? Because these have not only the NPK, but all the micronutrients in those tissues that are being composed. They got the nickel and the zinc and copper and those trace amounts that the plant uh, can respond. So I would think that a really serious scientific effort, but not just by scientists. I wouldn't trust scientists. It's done with farmers, <laughs> with farmers you know, providing ideas, testing, evaluating, but working with farmers to figure how do we grow, because biomass is a renewable resource. Sunlight, you got that. In many parts of the developing world, they got water and sunlight and lousy soils. They haven't quite figured out how do you, you know, make that transition. And again, I got, I got onto this, this check. I was in Ghana, early 90s, visiting an NGO partner. And they had done some experimentation with uh, leguminous trees, Tephrosia, Crotillaria, and so forth, Cispania. And they had taken land, which is about as planted these leguminous trees about one meter apart. The first year they said they had to use like pickaxe to dig out a pit and put some compost in with these trees. And the first year they said they had to water every day or they started wilting. He said second year, every other day was enough. Third year, every three or four days. Fourth year, once a week. Fifth, sixth, seventh year, never touched them. And this is the seventh year. And I wish you could all have this. You know, we walk across this, and you step into that field, and you put this down. Beautiful tilt in that soil. And it happened only because they had had these trees there, and the root activity, root exudation, the shading of the soil, of the soil, so the tropical sun didn't heat it up to 120, 130 degrees, you know, sterilizing the soil so all the microbes in the top three, four, five centimeters are baked. And just having that. Those, those trees growing there, putting leaf litter down, and then that being decomposed by the microorganisms being taken down into the soil by various macrofauna and mesofauna and so forth, 
had transformed what was useless land into good, for, they were gonna cut those trees down next year to have a proper vegetable plot. They had that much soil now that had been you know, restored. No investment other than the labor and using the germplasm of those plants. Now, the first answer was you can't do that on a large scale. And I say, who cares? If you're an African farmer and have nuts, this cruddy, lousy land, be patient. In seven years, you can get a really good, and in this case, it's the big patches you want. All it took was, you know, that nurturing, that managing of the germplasm. That's there free. I mean, you can get these seeds anywhere. You take cuttings and, you know, just root them and put them in. But it takes some work. You have to understand that the soil systems can be revitalized by the combination of plant roots and their activities and the organisms that you know, go with that. So I think you know, that we really have to figure out how do we get to follow up Schumacher. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. How do we solve that biomass processing application constraint? And worldwide, I mean, you know, this is not just the rice system. This is for everywhere. I'm, I'm a real fanatic on soil or organic carbon, what we can do with that. There's research from Kenya, which Cornell people did with Kenyan researchers in Western Kenya with smallholders, and they calculated, uh, Brent Swallows here, his friend Chris Barrett did the work with a Kenyan colleague, they found that for nitrogen fertilizer response, until you had at least 3% soil organic carbon, it was not enough to be economic. Now you could subsidize the fertilizer, and farmers could still make it do if it was 2% or 1%, but if you weren't subsidizing, just looking at the economics of it, until you got to 3% soil organic carbon, you were not getting a proper repayment for your investment in nitrogen fertilizer. Now, I think it's a fairly general phenomenon. We are often trying to solve you know, poor soil structure and functioning with fertilizer, when until we get enough organic matter, enough life restored in the soil, it's not gonna pay. Anyway, let me stop on that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I, I have a few uh, statements here. Please. Before we, we condemn Canada, uh, actually the, the... Did I uh, condemn Canada? I hope no, 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 before <laughs> the audience, yeah. 30% okay. uh, efficiency for nitrogen in India and, and, <clears throat> and uh, China. It's a 70% efficiency in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have minimum till, zero till, whatever. Land management is way better than what it used to be. The old system was, a, was denuding the land of its nutrients, mm -hmm. taking the organic fashion out. There's certainly lots of merit to the organic thing, but you hit the nail on the head mm -hmm. when you said organic meant micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And the other nail on the head was the fact that uh, in Britain in the 60s, mm -hmm. the suburban gardens on average per acre produced four times as much food as an acre of farmland mm -hmm. because right. of intensive care, looking mm -hmm. after them and watering them appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, oh, by the way, Washington has a 60 ton an acre, not 70 tons a hectare spud yield on uh, mm -hmm. irrigated sand land, eh? Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to put it this way, when you add organic factions to the soil, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes with farmers, it's, and often in Alberta, it's NNNNNNNN, nitrogen, phosphate, potash, mm -hmm. but what about sulfur, the micros, mag magnesium, manganese, zinc, copper, mm -hmm. those things are added. And some of these right. Euro uh, Asian lands have been farmed for 4,000 years. They've denuded the living hell out of them. Well, they've got to learn that fertility, mm -hmm. whether organic mm -hmm. or combined organic and inorganic is a balanced thing because mm -hmm. a crop, a bushel of wheat has a fixed amount of nutrients in it mm -hmm. and it doesn't vary and there's no miraculous cure, but it mm -hmm. is common sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. This reminds me, one of the leading texts, the U.S. at least, maybe Canada, is the text by Brady and others on, on soil systems, where sort of the essential message, if you take it out, you've got to put it back. At least I hear that from my agronomy colleagues. And at one level, it sounds very plausible, but I ask myself, how has the earth supported vegetative life production for the last 400 plus million years? I mean, you know, what you need to have is this continuous cycling, recycling. But if you keep the return of organic matter to the soil, we haven't gone 400 million years. But now we can screw it up and exhaust it. <laughs> but we, sh we should think about how do we work with and through and for these kinds of systems. Uh, when we went to Madagascar 
uh, first thing we knew is we got to get those rice yields up from two tons per hectare. And North Carolina State University, very respected peer institution, had done a PhD thesis for the agronomy department on these soils. They had 20 you know, five foot deep soil bores and they analyzed content at, you know, every 10 centimeters. They'd done absolutely, and these are well distributed around the uh, national park we were working in. And they found, first of all, pH was 3.8 to 5 usually, so really acid. With that went, of course, iron toxicity and lumen toxicity. The cation exchange capacity was low to very low in all horizons, they said, except for one of the, the borings they did. But the available phosphorus is only three to four parts per million. Those who are agronomists know that's less than half the minimum you usually need. You usually say at least 10 parts per million for any kind of crop production. They were three to four parts per million average. And so we thought, well, how are we going to do this? And then after our first season, how did our farmers go from two tons to eight tons average without adding any P on these soils that are so viciously deficient? and phosphorus, and that's, you need phosphorus. That was a puzzle, and then Marguerite came up with an article she saw in the Scientific, or in Nature magazine, 2001, which she gave me as on my way to Madagascar, and I read it, incredible. The title was Phosphorus Solubilization in Rewetted Soils by two British soil scientists, and they were studying the phosphorus levels at 29 locations in England and Wales for three years, and what they found was that in soils that were being wetted and dried, wetted and dried, versus all wet or all dried, the available phosphorus in these re-wetted soils went up to 185 to 1900 percent compared to the all wet or all dry. Staggering differences. And they speculated this was also applying for micronutrients. The mechanism which they the subsequent document is that these are the activities of phosphorus solubilizing bacteria which are bringing phosphorus from the unavailable portion of the soil into the available portion, because they ingest or acquire phosphorus during the aerobic phase of the soil, and then when you flood it, it becomes anaerobic, they lies, release their contents into the soil solution, and so then it's available. When the soil dries again, the survivors, because there always are some survivors inside of crevices and crannies of soil particles, they just start mining the soil again, and then you flood it, and so this process of the wetting and drying, we know in nitrogen, the Birch effect has that for nitrogen, but they were documented for phosphorus, but it probably also applies to micronutrients, this kind of mobilization. We often talk about microbes in the soil immobilizing nutrients. Well, that means they're saving, they're banking them, they're holding them in situ. That's good. You know, immobilization sounds sort of lurid or bad. And I want to say, no, we should get a different word. Immobilization is great. We need more of it. We need lots of life in the soil to sequester. That's what we call it, sequestering. Sequestering nutrients in the areas where the plants get access to them. But anyway, we were working with soils that by any objective scientific measurement were absolutely impossible. North Carolina State says these are some of the worst soils they've ever analyzed. And our farmers go from two tons to eight tons average without chemical fertilizer. That was pretty hard to understand. Now we think we're understanding is this the life in the soil, the management of the plants, the soil, the water, the nutrients, and then indirectly the management of the soil biota that gets us these kind of plant responses. Anyway, I could go on. For, uh, let me to give shorter answers. I have lots and lots to. Yes. Oh, oh you, you decide. Okay. Um, just a, a question about um, history. Mm -hmm. uh, my bedtime reading right now is Eckhart Pfeiffer's book, Soil Fertility. I can't hear you very well. Could you speak more into the microphone? Sure. Uh, my bedtime reading right now, Eckhart mm -hmm. Pfeiffer, Soil Fertility. And uh, mm -hmm. your practical conclusions, he also mentioned feeding the soil, mm -hmm. caring for the biology. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a student of uh, Rudolf Steiner. Okay lectures right. on agriculture and sort of the father mm -hmm. of biodynamic mm -hmm. agriculture. So I'm just wondering, is there a historical connection mm. between the SRI and the, and the Steiner School? Yeah. Not really. Um, I've done a little reading into this. There are, and also there's biointensive, biodynamic, you know, permaculture. There's a whole set of innovations that are all of the same principles behind them. What happened in those is they became somewhat doctrinal. 
if I can say, and then people became really very sort of exclusionary. You did it or you didn't. And one thing we tried to learn from those experiences is to be very open, the big tent, and not, you know, not, not doctrinal. I think that, that the biointensive or biodynamic, both are really very sensible. I mean, they're dealing with the same nature. And so I think we can learn a lot, uh, lot from them. Um, but um, the most interesting bit of history I just learned recently was some discussion of how after World War I, when both sides had developed these large capacities to produce nitrate for their respective you know, munitions, <laughs> they started thinking, oh, we can use this nitrate for fertilizer. And we get good crop response, as we can demonstrate. Especially then after World War II, when we again built up our nitrate and ammonium capacities even greater, you had a huge effort then to shift that capacity into producing fertilizers so it would help feed the world. Uh, some of the companies, for instance, supported the Freedom From Hunger campaign, which FAO and other agencies promoted. It sounded, and I don't want to attribute malevolent intentions, but it certainly is a little, it's interesting historically to see how what, you know, this means is another way of doing swords into plowshares, right? Uh, uh, so we did swords into plowshares, taking our nitrate production for weapons and putting it into fertilizer. So I there are some negative externalities from that. And again, there are time, we find that in SRI, that we have a number of research studies showing that some amount of nitrogen fertilizer with organics gives you better yield than either one alone. If you have only inorganic, our trials generally show that you can top that with organic, but you do even better with some kind of optimization. We call it integrated nutrient management. You know, we're not against integrated nutrient management. When we work with small and poor farmers, we tell them you don't need to be buying fertilizer. You can, with available biomass, meet your crop's needs. But if you're trying to push, push the limits, you've got the resource to do it, find you some combination. Uh, so I, I think we should be aware that, you know, this push to promote inorganic fertilizers is not simply coming, you know, from the, uh, from the researchers. There's been a set of strong commercial interests that have moved our agriculture in that direction. Did it work? Hey, if we hadn't had and hadn't been using nitrogen and fertilizers, not knowing better ways of doing this, you know, we would have much more hunger and starvation in the world. Uh, but I don't think we need for the next, you know, the next you know, decades to stay on that track. Now that we have the environmental limitations of nitrate buildup, we're having effects on, on ecosystems that are not beneficial. So we should be figuring out how can we sort of make that transition to going, uh, going back, I wanna say that, Dean. <laughs> um, going forward to a more biologically, you know, uh, informed, more biologically driven production strategy. But Steiner was onto that Almost, almost 100 years ago, <laughs> and Thank others you. have been too. Thank you. Last one. Oh, we, we did it 5:30, but so. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll be hanging around. So come on, this is the last one, please. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Which don't? Sedges. 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 Oh, sedges. Okay. Yeah. Right. West Jackson, yes. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I, I'm going to say, I, at one point I was really into endophytic mycorrhizae, and then somehow it, it sort of slipped a bit off my screen, but you're quite right, I should be talking about them more too. When you flood your rice, we do know you won't get endophytic mycorrhizae because they're aerobes. And so we've given up the benefits of those symbiotic endophytes for millennia by flooding our rice. Part of the effect we're seeing, I think, comes from 
but I've gotten no one to study that yet. I even took a microscope down to Cuba in 2004 to give to the Rice Research Institute in Cuba because they, they don't even have microscopes there. And I said, I'll give you a microscope if you will look at endophytic mycorrhizae in SRI plants versus regulars. They never did, unfortunately. So I have no evidence that I can cite for you, but I'm quite sure that's part of the effect, and I should talk about them more. I'm sorry I didn't do that. Um, about 85 to 90 percent of all the terrestrial plants you know, do have mycorrhizal support. We don't know the extent because we don't look enough at it. But essentially, I think that's a big part of it, too. So we've got the mycorrhizal fungi, we've got the various rhizobia, we've got the effect of certain fungi in the seeds, which I talked about. We don't know where this ends. I mean, you know, some say it's the basidiomycetes that are really helping, and I don't know enough about basidiomycetes to, to answer that. I wish we had, first of all, I say, I wish we had more soil biology, microbiology being done. Uh, I've offered at many fora, even international fora, to make the following bet. And I say, I will bet you that if you take all of the soil science in the whole world for the last 50 years, that 60, 70 percent out of soil chemistry, 20, 25 percent soil physics, but less than 10 percent soil biology, no one has ever, and I, actually now we're getting up close to 10. But if you take the last 50 years, it's going to be two, three, four, five percent. And if you take all of the crop science in the whole world for the last 50 years, I'll bet money that 90, 95 percent is above ground, probably five percent or less is below ground, and people say, oh, it's one or two percent. And then when I want to be provocative, which I usually do, I say, if you had been director of research for the whole world and you had allocated your research resources that way, you should be fired, right? The only person who ever challenged me that was my dean, who said we didn't have the, the, you know, the tools to do the soil biology work before. And I said, but if we'd been trying, I think we would have gotten the tools sooner. <laughs> They've come in the last 10 years, so I mean, we we're making big progress at still a pretty crude level in soil biology with uh, various kinds of tests. But I think that uh, we need to understand we have not invested adequately in either soil biology or root physiology, morphology, et cetera, is not to say the other work was wrong or bad. It simply hasn't been balanced. Every soil science textbook I've said starts saying soil is a combination of chemical, physical, biological characteristics. That's sort of the starting point. But then biology is chapter 14, or maybe 12 now. But it's just relegated because why? It's messy, it's dirty, it's ambiguous, it's hard to replicate. The, you know, those buggies down there don't stay still. And you know, change the temperature by one or two degrees, and you got a whole different population to deal with. You try to control all that, and something else throws you. I mean, it's really, I salute anyone who works in soil microbiology, or anyone who works on roots. These are sort of heroic areas to work in. If I'm an assistant professor, you know, I'm not going to work in those areas. I'm going to do something in soil chemistry. I can get things published that way quickly. Now, that area has been pretty well mined, so it's harder and harder to find meaningful new stuff to do. We're really behind. So I just think we're going to see a real expansion. I'll say this for the dean's benefit. If you can, at the margin, try to get more soil biologists, microbiologists, soil ecologists. If you look at one species by itself, you often don't get the right, same answer or the right answer as you understand it in its ecological setting. These are really complex matters. They're highly dynamic, changeable, highly contingent. And most of our reductionist science doesn't deal well with contingency. Just think how different our science would be if instead of saying we controlled for variables A, B, and C, we said we excluded the effects of A, B, and C. It means the same thing, but we've been able to sort of be, oh, we, ex we controlled for A, B, and C. We say it smugly, proudly, we controlled. And I say, no, no, we should never say that. We should say we excluded the effects of a, B, and C, and I think we look at all of our science rather differently if we substitute that one word for three words. So uh, I, I think a lot of the work we've done because of, and like in soil science, been done under azenic conditions. When I first got into reading about soil, I said, what's azenic mean? A, X, E, N, I, C. Where does that word come from? Finally, ah, A hyphen X, E, N, I, C, not zenic. What does zenic mean? 
has the same Greek root as the word for xenophobia. So Asianic soil is soil which has no strangers, no foreigners in it. We've eliminated, we you know, got rid of all the life there, which implies or infers that the soil organisms are strangers in their own habitat. They don't belong there. And we can have better, truer studies of soil if we just get rid of them and of the effects they introduce. I just think that's bizarre. This is if we did all our medical research on cadavers. And much of our soil science is just cadaver soil science. I'm sorry if you soil scientists that may be offended by this, but you know, we should think about that. So I think a lot of what we think we know about soils is simply not true in a soil system. I did a book, I edited a book, put together a book called Biological Approaches to Sustainable Soil Systems for CRC Press six years ago. I had 102 contributors from 28 countries, including three World Food Prize laureates, two directors of international centers as co-editors. I said, I, I'm not a scientist, you know. I'm not your kind of scientist. If you will vouch for the science, I will do the work and get the things together and make them readable across disciplines. But it was really interesting that we got a tremendous re response. That book has not been reviewed by a single agronomy journal yet, even though it comes from CRC Press, Pedro Sanchez is one of the co-editors, Hans Herren, you know, uh, Jules Pretty, uh, people from Sierra, and so it has been just ignored because biological approaches to sustainable soil science is sort of not, soil systems is not on the agenda. But we very purposely, we're not talking about soil, we're talking about soil systems. Because if you don't deal the soil with the life in it, you're not really looking at soil. So we made that you know, soil, systems and the uh, noun is systems <laughs> soil is the adjective soil as a noun is not all that interesting it's, you know, but anyway i could go for a long time i guess we will want to uh reconvene to the lobby for a reception i'll be here and i'll be glad my wife by the way can answer a lot of these things too so i hope you'll get to meet marguerite uh she's been working and traveling with me for the last 10 12 years on this too so uh, uh well thank you very much